What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Um, before we start the podcast, I would love it if you subscribe, share, tell your mates about this podcast. Um, we're we're getting some through some episodes. It's been going for a, a long time, so I really appreciate all of you that have like stayed from the beginning um, and any new people that are involved and enjoy it and share it on the socials really, really means the world to me. So thank you very much for that. This episode I'm really excited about. Disco Donny, um, one of the biggest electronic music pr- promoters in America. Um, he, Him and his company promote over a thousand shows a year which is crazy to even think about some of the biggest festivals in america he has created scenes in cities and states that you would never even imagine would have electronic music even be in that city or state um so i i really really respect what he's done for the scene in america and is one of the reasons why there is a scene in america he has been doing this for years, since the 90s, and has some amazing stories. So I thought it would be amazing for you all to learn about some history of American rave scene and also learn about the ups and downs of his career. And there's some really interesting bits from being arrested and having a federal case on him, um, throwing huge parties in raves, losing everything um yeah it's it's a really interesting conversation i really really enjoyed this one so without further ado disco donny donny how are you man good man how's it going yeah really good really good thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate taking you taking some time out um means, oh, of course it means a lot man um where where in the world are you uh I'm, i live in puerto rico so i'm, I'm oh, home nice. right now how long you been so. how long you been living there I've been here 13 years, so it's um, it's been a it's definitely been life changing. So it's been it's it's uh, really great here. So what made you yeah, move out? I've then? enjoyed it. I married a Puerto Rican. Makes sense. Um, don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> uh, living here is nice. Yeah, I've never been. I've I've never been. I'm still married to her, so probably she she won't see this. I don't. It's hopefully fine. not. So it's fine. We, it's okay. We won't tell her. We will cut it out. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Do you um do you prefer living over there than the states? I obviously it is kind of part of the states, but um, I mean, it's you know it's it's different for sure. Yeah. Um, but you know it, it's been a great place to raise a family, mm. and um, you know I could have, you know, I, I if I would have moved to LA or New York or something, there would have been a lot more business opportunities. But um, I've you know I've done well for myself. Yeah. And here, and I think. Uh, my life, the quality of life has been a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? Cause there does come a point where it's like, well, how much do you actually need to do in your life? When, when's the, right. when, when's the, like the end of the, the mountain where you're like, yeah, I've actually done enough. Do, do you think it is that's given you the chance to kind of evaluate that? Um, a little bit. I mean, it's more about there's, you know, there's meetings going on all the time and, um, and, and different opportunities. And so, uh, you know, and, and artists coming through town, I mean, I just yeah. don't even, not a lot of people come through here, so I don't get to see a lot of artists, maybe just at the festivals and stuff. Yeah. So it's a little bit different. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I have, I thought about it. I, um, yes. I mean, have I had regrets? Not really. Mm. Um, you know, the, you know, my biggest regret was that I was raised in new Orleans and I never thought I would leave there. And, um, every time I go back there, I'm just like, uh, I'm just so still enamored with the city. Um, so yeah, basically that's the only thing I really miss would be, you know, living in new Orleans and, and that lifestyle, but it's been great here and I've made a lot of good friends and, yeah. um, it's been great for the kids and, and, and it's been great for uh, my wife has her, her whole family here. So it's been great for her. Makes sense. Makes sense. Do you go back to new Orleans often? Um, yeah, my oldest son is in college there and my mom still lives there. Yeah. Um, so, um, go, I'm actually going back next week for his graduation, which oh, is, uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, um, go to a few saints games every year and yeah, yeah. So I, 
I, I still do shows there. So definitely try to make it back as, as often as possible. Yeah. I've only ever been to that city once. Um, in fact, you know, you know, Max, um, Max Braun. Yeah. Uh, from, yeah. I, I went, I was at his wedding, <laughs> uh, just before, oh, yeah. just, okay. be, just before the yeah, pandemic. I heard, <laughs> and I heard it, about that. Yeah. It was crazy. Um, but it's, it's an amazing city, man. It's like there's something super special about that city, and I'm not too sure what it is. I think it's the history, but it's kind of so many cultures all coming together as one, and it's yeah, it's super for sure. special, super special. What I want to so first of all, I guess like I want to go fully back to where it started for you. I think there's a lot of people that know who you are and what you do nowadays and kind of what you represent now um but i kind of want people to understand where it all started from from childhood to to now um so i kind of want to go back to new orleans growing up in new orleans and your childhood and how it all started from my childhood what what great i started (laughs) (laughs) Uh, oh so uh no i mean look uh i was born and raised in new orleans Uh, i you know, my mom threw my uh, dad out of the house um, when I was about eight. And uh, he basically was gone. I didn't see him for about a year. And uh, when he turned up, he, he was a he was a very successful lawyer. Um, and but, you know, he had a lot of issues and stuff. We were basically running around town all the time, chasing him um uh at different bars and and you know woman a lot of womanizing and uh, uh, he had a lot of stuff going on besides the the <laughs> law practice um so uh yeah so my mom made the tough decision of um you know kicking him out of the house uh, he disappeared for about a year um and he when he turned back up he was um actually he had given up his law practice and he had become um, a DJ, um, at as you do. named uh, at named Disco Jim. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> this is in the seventies. So. <laughs> this is when it was like, you know, it was popping. Yeah. And then I guess from from then on, I like is that how you became started to to, to like listen to music through through your dad, uh, or was it like New Orleans is like so so rich in music generally? Yeah, no, my mom used to take me to Jazz Fest and, I, you know, I um, every year. And so, you know, it was definitely always ingrained in me. And, uh, you know, I started reunited with my dad and started mm-hmm. going to the uh, I would go to the club with him. And, and uh, you know, whenever he had his weekend or whatever, so I would stay, sleep in the office, um, go through the through all the vinyl. And um, so I guess that was my indoctrination on both ends, uh, into, into the music. I was also, I was a singer in a, a band in grade school and it was never, it wasn't because I could sing. Um, it was basically because I was the only one that had the, uh, confidence to, to get in front of people <laughs> with a, <laughs> on a stage and with a microphone in my hand. I mean, unfortunately I wasn't a, um, I wasn't a, good singer yeah um or any i wasn't even a serviceable singer but uh i I did have enough confidence that um you know that i can get on the stage and and, uh and and be a front man i love that so much i love that did your dad own a club no he was the he was the dj and he 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 did all these like extravagant skits and um yeah, different, you know, to different songs. And they had, uh, they, they basically one night he did this like urban cowboy theme and they, and like he had everybody sign all these, um, legal waivers so they could ride like the bucking Bronco. Uh, and it was under this big giant, like sheet. And so all these people were waiting in line to, you know, ride the, the Bronco. And it was, it turns out he, he had just rented like a, uh, what those little, uh, ponies that they have in front of the grocery store, you know, just put a quarter in. Um, so, you know, he, he was doing his own thing. I mean, he was happy. Yeah. Um, he didn't want to, obviously he didn't want to be a lawyer. Um, so yeah, so he, uh, he ended up 
uh, he he ended up moving up to manager of the club, mm. but his he was still he was still disco Jim. Disco Jim to to everyone. I take it that's where you got the disco Donny from, right? I think so. Yeah. I well, when I started, uh, when I first started going to parties, and um, you know, I basically was wearing like his old clothes and he had a lot of stuff that said disco on them. Uh, okay. And so at first people were calling me disco somehow it morphed into some, uh, this to disco Donnie. Um, so it, it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely, I didn't give myself the moniker, but, um, yeah, I could see why, uh, right. you know, I kind of, I embraced it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's, um, it's, it's, it's wild how things like that happen, but I guess from, so, what what was the what was the club that your dad was at? Was it called Catnip or something like that? No, it was like Scratches. 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 It was like a it was like a pool. Uh, pool. Hall. It had like a lot of pool tables Amazing. and a lot of video games. I just remember, like you know, because I would play the video games all the time. Yeah. Um, because we had the keys. So, uh, yeah, I just remember as a kid just living in that place. Yeah. Um. So, and but yeah, so. Um, yeah, so somehow my mom, uh, single mom raised me, um, and, uh, basically ended up, I ended up going to, um, uh, LSU for college yep. and I was studying accounting. Um, and I was in, I was engaged to be married to my longtime, wow. my high school girlfriend, wow. um, who was like, valedictorian of her school like president of her school um uh, my mrs perfect right <laughs> and uh <laughs> how did that and there was uh yeah they did yeah i didn't matter but I, I i think i felt uh yeah um yeah and i was and i was less than perfect let's put it that way <laughs> and uh yeah when we came back to new orleans um and we were about i don't know about a year uh, from getting married, uh, I was waiting, I was having to be waiting tables, um, uh, on weekends. I was working at my mom's CPA firm, yeah. uh, during the week cause I was going to take that over. Uh, and then I was waiting tables during the weekends just to, to make some real money, yeah. uh, for, for the wedding <laughs> and, uh, and some other waiters like, Hey, you want to go to a party? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. I'll go check it out. And, uh, yeah, so I went to my first, I guess, rave and, uh, I was just, when I walked through those doors, I was just blown away and I kind of like, you know, when I had moved from back from school into New Orleans, I kept, finally kept, felt like I was missing something. And when I walked through those doors, I also felt like I had found it. So it was definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, a life changing experience for me um, because I was like, wow, you know, how, why didn't I know about this? And, uh, you know, the second, so the second thing was I was, I was upset that I didn't, I didn't know, find out about this earlier. And, um, and then also I was, I was like, it, it was, it was a really, um, it was a really eccentric mix of people, uh, all different, all different types of people, right? That normally you wouldn't see uh, at the same party together. And it was like, I just found what I, I was like, it just filled that void that I was looking for. And so I, from that moment on, I was like, well, this is amazing, but you guys are terrible. There wasn't really no way. It was like a hundred people there. I'm like, you guys are terrible at, uh, <laughs> at you know, <laughs> promoting. I, I have more friends in this um so uh from that moment on i just kind of started helping out promoting um just on the side i would just grab the flyers from the table and i started promoting the shows and bringing in more people mm. what year are we talking this is like 93 i think when i first got back from school uh maybe the end of 93 and um, and then basically, yeah, people started noticing that, uh, I was out there, you know, I was going out every night now promoting these shows. I was going to wherever people were, like I had a whole crew already. 
that I was hanging out with. Uh, my fiance was not happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, basically people, uh, somebody offered to hire, I was just doing it for fun. Yeah. I was just doing it cause I had it like, this was just a, it was a hobby. Um, you know, I was going, I was shopping at thrift stores every day. I was, you know, I, I really bought into the, the, I was going to the record stores. I really bought into the culture, uh, right away, like a hook, line and sinker. Mm. And, um, yeah, I just started promoting somebody who offered to hire me and I said, no, I don't, I don't want any money. No, I don't want any money. And they just insisted, they insisted. And, uh, the guy like, at the end of the night, I got, he got like 600 people and they were, this was like a huge improvement over, over the numbers that, uh, they had been getting. Mm. And, you know, they, they were just ecstatic and the guy was like, Oh, you know, let me give you your payment. And he gave me like two hits of ecstasy and he was like the <laughs> drug dealer too. So it was probably, he gave me like 20 bucks. Right. I was like, Oh, it was like a big fuck you. And I was like, I didn't want any money. And now you're, now you're, you know, telling me, you know, get, give me a hundred bucks or something yeah. or, you know, so, um, that was kind of when I, my first like realization about, uh, like the, on the business side. Right. So like, I never try to put myself in that position again when, so, you know, now everybody's all the promote, all the established motors are asking me to, to help them. And so I was like, yeah, I'll help you, but you know, I want half the door. Yeah. And that's kind of where I was like, and it still was a game for me. Right. I still had all my, I still had my whole other life that I was about to embark on. Mm. And, uh, so, uh, but I just wasn't going to put myself in a position again, where just left it arbitrary that somebody could just give me 20 bucks. Totally. Totally. What was the music like then in New Orleans? It was really, I mean, it's really hard to say because, you know, th this is pre-internet. Yeah. This is, um, uh, so there was no real, like, you couldn't really put things in buckets like you can today. Mm. Like, okay, this is like dubstep or this is drum and bass yeah. or this is house. Um, you know, it was kind of all over the place. When I listened to the songs that um, that a lot of people played, I mean, it, it was like a lot of uh, like I guess you would call break beats. Yeah. Um, um, definitely like some uh, techno influences. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, you would hear Omni Trio and yeah, um, yeah, and and, and uh, you know. Uh, and uh, Joey Beltram and so mm. it, so there was like you know it, but it was all over but we didn't even know what it like you have to understand if you weren't a DJ like there was no way to get the information like it was like oh I like I like the song but I never knew who was actually who who actually made the song yeah um you know the only way for us to really get um information like we would go to Tower Records and they had uh you know maybe they had some CDs there yeah. Um, and like a, they had like a rave section and excuse me. So, and basically, uh, yeah, I mean, you could, you could see what the, who put, who, who made the tracks and who this DJ that made the mix and stuff. But, and then some, you know, we were getting some, uh, some, from some, uh, magazines were kind of coming in at the, uh, record at the record stores and stuff. So, you know, you could get information there, but I mean, it was really in the early nineties. I mean, there was just, there was no track IDs. Let's yeah. put it that way. I love that though. Cause I like, I was watching the rise documentary the other night and the soundtrack to the rise documentary is absolutely amazing. Like, it's, oh yeah, uh, dude, it's unbelievable. And uh, it, yeah, jo Josh Wink did that. Jo yeah. Josh did it. And yeah, I was like this, is like a really interesting concept because you don't have that nowadays where you go to a show and it's like a bunch of everything, but right. it really was back then. And DJ and, and putting on shows was, a was not necessarily like a genre thing. It was like, you're just going to party and 
be part of it. Yeah, that's what we didn't know. We yeah. didn't, we had we didn't know. We just liked the music. I mean, there was a lot of Josh Wink at the parties. I should have just, I should have <laughs> thrown that in there for sure. But, um, but is it, it was also so, a really interesting time for America musically in the electronic scene with with like Chicago, with New York, with Detroit. Like you had some insane music being made in the country then, and it right. was it was just like a hodgepodge of everything. And no, no one yeah. knowing anything because it's a brand it was, new thing, right? It was definitely like we we were um, it, we were just happy with getting something, right? Yeah. So we just, but we didn't know what we were. We didn't know anything, right? So um, yeah, so it was kind of like there was no there, there was no tribes or anybody breaking off into the separate groups or. Yeah different rooms or something like that. It was like, everybody was there, uh, you know, listening to the same music and enjoying it. And I mean, the, the, the DJ would be all over the place, right? He wasn't like playing, he wasn't playing like one sound. Right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it was definitely a, it was a good times. There's something so amazing about that though, that, that we just don't get nowadays to a certain extent that I, that I think, it's so easy nowadays to put everyone in a box and kind of package it in a nice commercial way and make money out of it. But I think it, there's something so organic about that initial naivety of the music industry or in the rave scene. Yeah, no, I mean, I get why people have separated into their own totally. little uh, you know, silos. Uh, I totally understand because, uh, but back then, like it just didn't matter. And, and, you know, I, I really miss those days. Yeah. Okay. That's why, I mean, that's why as a promoter now, when people ask me, like, I do have my own personal preferences on, on what music style I like, but you know, that's not my, you know, I've never been one to, to, if I just played, if I would have just done artists that if I, to, if the sound that I mostly enjoy, then I would have been out of business a long time ago. <laughs> I wouldn't have made it to the the house revolution, right? Yeah. So um, I would have been, yeah. So you know, but that's not my job. My job is to make everybody happy, yeah. not just one subsection of uh, of people. So you know, I you know, I actually, you know, it's like this the the bullshit promoter um, answer, right? But I I have to enjoy it all, and I, you know, I actually do. So. Mm. Um, when, you know, when was I that can... realization for you though because I think there comes a point when you're in a career or when you when you when you decide that to, to embark into this career that you have to do that and you have to please everybody else and this isn't a egotistical thing where you can just please yourself well as things well I mean I think it was more about like uh, it was better as a promoter, I never really thought about it until later, mm. but you know, it was good for me when like when in the nineties that, you know, all of a sudden like drum and bass, um, you know, exploded yeah. and it was good. You know, I actually enjoyed it. Um, so, but it also, now I have more, you know, I have more, it expanded the options of artists that I could book. Right. Yeah. And so, an offer to to the fans so it definitely all these different like um genres like splitting off and all it it just uh it helped me out as a promoter to be able to uh you know i don't want to do the same artist over and over i mean i want to bring new people yeah um and i want to keep changing it up and so the those new genres becoming popular or people becoming interested in it helped open a lot of doors and now I'm doing, you know, uh, you know, going from a, uh, a stage, a main stage and a local stage to a main stage, a drum bass stage, a local stage to a, a main stage, a, a house stage, yeah. uh, a drum bass stage and a local stage. So, you know, it's just expanding out what we could do. Um, and so it was it, it definitely kept it interesting and definitely kept um, people, um, you know, people coming. Yeah, totally. When in the nineties was it when you realized like this is what I have to do full time? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
there was there was definitely some starts and stops. Yeah. I think I mean I don't have the exact um uh I know I I know at some point well I quit the um uh, I quit the uh the weight I quit weighing tables um after you know maybe about six to eight months of doing events because uh they had I was on call and I had a big show and uh yeah I got called in I was like I'm not coming <laughs> you know that's like that's uh uh, so that was the end of that. Um, I actually, I think I hit a rough patch. Um, actually, I ended up going back to waiting <laughs> tables at the same place and then had to quit again. Um, and yeah, I mean, I remember telling my mom, I think it was when I was quitting the, um, was quitting the firm, the CPA firm. And I was basically like, Hey, um, I don't want to be, I don't think I want to be an accountant, you know, I'm sorry. And it's just kind of like the same time I'm like telling my fiance that I don't think I want, I don't want to be married. Um, I had took, taken her to a, uh, to a party and it didn't go very well. <laughs> she didn't uh, enjoy it as much as I did. <laughs> ah, she just like, She's like, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> so I was like, oh, you know, so I had to like really, I had to make some life decisions. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I would have, this was in the end, it was, it was painful for everyone. But, uh, I, you know, it, it, this was not a, uh, this wasn't something that, you know, that it's, in the end, it was the best thing that ever happened to her. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, yeah, it would have been, she would have been miserable. So, um yeah. So, I mean, I just, I came to the realization is like, Hey, I'm going to make a run at this. I mean, I didn't think I'd be doing it for 30 years. Mm. Um, that's for sure. But, uh, I definitely thought I could do it and do it well. And, uh, and, you know, and make a, you know, put a roof over my head. Mm. I think for me in this industry promoting, I've done it before and it's literally the hardest thing in this industry, in my personal opinion, because there's so many options for everybody to, 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 to go and do on a Friday, Saturday, Thursday, whatever night of the week, there's so many options for people to, 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 to have and to go and do and getting people to a show is fucking impossible sometimes. Yeah. I mean, look, it's not, um, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, right. There's a lot of, and, and now, I mean, it's a, it's a lot different from when it was then. Right. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I would have like 500 bucks on the line or something. <laughs> and so, you know, the numbers are so big now. Yeah. I mean, you have to really, um, you know, my, my sons have um, asked about, they were like, Oh, I want to do what you do. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you don't want this. You don't want this life. Yeah. I mean, you have to really be able to, you have to, uh, really be able to like disconnect from reality. Um, and just hope everything goes okay. You know, just so it's like, you know, imagine waking up every morning and, you know, you have $20 million in shows. Yeah. And like the, in the next six months, I mean, uh, it's sometimes if you really think about it, if you really like, if you're a smart person and really thought about it, you would be, yeah, it would drive you crazy. Of course. So yes, yeah, so you have to like basically be able to, you know, work, ha have workarounds and be like, it's going to, you know, it'll work out. You do this, you got this. Um, and so you know, it's, it's not, it's just, it's not a normal life and it's not for, uh, it's not for like a normal person. Let's put it that way. No, because I, I can, wouldn't recommend, I wouldn't recommend. It. Cause I can imagine that like, what's like, I, I know as an art, like as an artist, as a DJ producer, like the stress, it, the mental stress we put on ourselves for, for us as, as an artist without sounding flappy dappy, like, 
is I can't even imagine sometimes the stress that you guys go through to like how do you even deal with that um is it something yeah, that I mean, gets better not, over years or easier no no no, yeah. no it doesn't it gets worse because when I was young I didn't really understand like I was doing shows in warehouses with yeah. uh you know with no permits and uh, you know selling alcohol to minors and no security guards and yeah. no insurance and um so the good old days uh yeah you know the the of the really disconnected days so yeah. i mean but at the time it didn't really you know i was young right so now and i didn't really have anything to lose yeah um you know now i have a family i have a house uh you know it's definitely a different uh you know and, and, and you're risking uh, on on any weekend of a festival or something like that you know you're risking it all yeah so um yeah it hasn't become easier because i've become uh i've become wiser mm. and so um you know you try to do the best you can to protect yourself from like uh, uh from the downsides um but you know it's there's always a fact that there's something that that could happen that's kind of beyond anyone's control or it's something that maybe uh, you didn't think of yeah. and you could be left holding a, a, you know, a $10 million bill. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, what do you do? So you have to think about, you always think about all the positives, like, Oh, we're going to sell out and we're going to, uh, this is what we're going to make. And, but you also have to have, you have to be you know, smart about it and think about what, what could happen if, if it all went bad. Have you ever been in a situation or how many, can you give us an example for a situation where it's like gone shit, hit the fan? Cause it's definitely happened over the years unless you're the, I mean, we've had like, um, yeah. I mean, when there's been multiple times, I'm yeah. trying to think when's the most recent one. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, we have, we just had like a, we had a, uh, weather cancellation um in it was 2022 yeah. it was it was like basically it was one day it was a one day cancellation we had we got the saturday in the sunday um you know that like the sunday was supposed to be like a tornado and uh you know hail and you know all life threatening weather and yeah. you know you just so, and then you have me, um, um, all of a sudden me who didn't have, you know, I'm asking like the fire, uh, the police chief, the fire marshal, what do you got? What should I do? I'm asking my team. They're all like, well, I don't know. You know, like, uh, you know, nobody wants to be on the hook. Of course. Right? Of course. Nobody. So, and so now, um, you know, it, 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 the decision bounces back to me, the, boss, the yeah. guy, the guy that did shows in warehouses <laughs> with, <laughs> you know, with nothing. So, I mean, I, I'm like, wait, I didn't sign up for this part. Right. Why am I, I don't want to be the responsible one. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I, I pushed, I pushed it, I pushed it, pushed it as long as we could go. And then, you know, I called like a, a meeting. It was like 14 people, all the city officials and everything and went around, asked everybody's opinion. It's not, I'm just getting a bunch of like non answers. Of course. And, you know, and so, you know, now the, the, the clock's ticking, people are, the security guards are showing up. Um, and so, you know, now I have to like make the call. So I basically was like, let's call the national weather service. Right. So I, uh, the, the the head of uh, safety or whatever calls the the lady at the national. We have them on. We have we're hired them for the weekend, right? Yeah. And so he calls her, and she's like, "Oh, you know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a disaster. The storm's <laughs> gonna blow through. It's gonna knock everything down." So right there, that was the that was the answer, right? Because all these people, Fuck. all these city officials, and all heard that on the call. They would have been the witnesses at my, uh, yeah. at my trial, you know? So, um, 
you know, that was the answer. And so, you know, you have to, so we canceled that day. And of course, you know, the storm blew through, but the, the major part, uh, we would have had to probably do a couple of evacuations, mm. but as, as, as kids, you know, they don't see, they don't see that. Right. They just saw that it wasn't like that bad. Um, so yeah, you know, you take a lot of shit online. Yeah. Um, and then you have to, you have to, uh, refund everyone. Yeah. Um, which is a whole process and people are, some people, we need to we need to send out thousands of checks, and um, you know people are moving all over. I mean, we still haven't been able to give everybody their money back, yeah, um, because it's just a it's a mess. And then it was because it was a partial refund, yeah. Um, so if you were on a payment plan, we needed to send you a check. Um, and then I don't know people. I know we have cancellation insurance, um, so people think, oh, you made your money back, but you know they did they don't pay you for like eight months. Yeah. So I have to refund everybody like $2 million. I have to pay every, all the vendors, all their money. Of course. And then I have to fight with the insurance company for eight months. Yeah. And then they don't give you, they don't give you the $2 million. They deduct, like they deduct what you, you, you know, your $200,000 in insurance, they deduct your deductible. Yeah. So in the end, you, you know, you end up working like, 10 times as hard and you still lose like five or six in a grand. I mean, yeah. it's just like a, it's kind of a buzzkill and everybody's mad at you. Yeah. And I guess the, the, the thing that I want to kind of ask is when you do that festival again, or when you do that show again, is it harder to sell tickets because of the previous experience? Yeah. That's a whole nother, you know, you lose goodwill yeah. with people. They're like, Oh, you know, it always gets canceled. And, yeah. um, or, you know, it's, why are you doing it this time of year? It's rainy season. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it, it, it hurts the brand mm. for sure. Cause people travel from everywhere, right? And you can't give them, you can't reimburse their hotel and you can't ever give them that back. And they're, right. Oh, I got my new outfit. And, and, um, so yeah, if you were trying to reimburse people for that, you know, the, the, the bill would be another million dollars. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I couldn't even imagine the stress. I remember um I remember when I played Dirty Bird East Coast. This was years ago. I think it was 2017 and they hadn't they hadn't pulled any permits for for the oh, yeah. for the venue. And I got I turned up on the Saturday and obviously we were all like super close friends. So you're in the office and you're just like this is an absolute shit show. Like, and then they have weather issues and you're just like, I couldn't even imagine what is, and that was on a very small scale festival. So like to think what you guys do on a weekly basis is just, it's crazy to me. And, and the amount of people involved that kind of rely on your decision and yeah, like this, that is insane amounts of stress. All, all we have to worry about as artists is don't push the wrong button. It's literally all yeah. we have to worry no, about. I want to go. If I could go back in time, I would have been a DJ. I would have been a the at the beginning. The promoter made all the money, and that's yeah. when I was like, "Oh, look, I'm the smart one." Yeah. And now I still, yeah, now I still make the same amount of money that I did in '94, and but now <laughs> I pay the DJ uh, a thousand times more. Yeah. So I should have, yeah. I just made a poor choice. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I want to go back to back a little further and you have scaled disco donny presents on another level you're hands down one of the biggest electronic promoters in america unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> um, should have picked another genre too. <laughs> yeah do you do anything outside of electronic i i've dabbled in some stuff you know um you know, when I was when I first got into the, the rave scene, there was a lot of hip hop. So, I mean, we did a lot of like old school hip hop because that we were like the two scenes were like kindred spirits. Yeah. So we did a lot of that at our shows. Um, I've done some, you know, I've done some other stuff, but it just uh, it never felt really genuine. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to be like the like. Uh, oh, you know, going up to uh, doing a country show, and yeah, like it just didn't feel like 
so we're, we're, we're kind of branching out into other genres now just yeah. because uh, it just makes sense. And I'm kind of over that, like the awesome author, yeah, authenticity part. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Time to make some money. Like, yeah, no, well, I mean, I have a team that we can do, we can do whatever. Right. Yeah. So I can't let my, like we can do, we do good events. So exactly. uh, why not like delve into other things um, and let my, let that whole ego part go where mm. it's like, well, I don't feel comfortable um you know faking this but i mean yeah. in the end it's like it's like it's about the artist and and um, it's not really it's not about me um it's about you know the show and the artist so it's also um, about the experience isn't it for for the 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 ticket buyer and if you can yeah. cre- if you can create a really amazing experiences for the for the person that's going to the show and for the artist that's playing the show it's like yeah, Why we not? can do that. So I had to, yeah. I was just, I always had like a wall about those type of things. So I was like, ah, oh, you know, I don't want to. Um, I always like thought it was kind of weird, like these promoters doing all this different uh, genres and stuff, but I can see it now. We're working on a rock festival in Dallas, like oh, an cool. emo fest yeah. in Dallas. It's been really interesting. My team's excited about it. Yeah. Um, because they're, they grew up on all of that. Yeah. And so again, I had to remove my, uh, my ego from the from the equation and 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 go where you know and look at the different business opportunities yeah totally i get that um i want to go back to from when you go from promoting full time and then scaling that to where you're at now how the hell do you even get there well i was doing like in the nineties, I was doing, um, I had started doing stuff around the South. Yeah. Like people started reaching out. Um, it was a little bit different back then because you couldn't really, everybody had their promoters in their cities and they, you know, they were all in a, like a, a, a death match, right. They were all fighting with each other and yeah. over dates and artists and stuff like that. So in the, like in the, maybe like in 97, 98, I started doing stuff in, well, I started doing stuff in Texas. I just, my first show in Austin was in 96. Uh, I was doing stuff in Atlanta, stuff in Houston, stuff in Dallas. But you couldn't really, at the time, it would have been um, a detrimental to put my logo, it was for what everybody thought, you know, my logo on a flyer in another city because mm. it just would have been like, it was just so tribal. Like, it was like the mob, right? Everybody had their families and they're in there and there and they like they were all at war with each other so if you add somebody else into the mix uh it just made everybody like hypersensitive yeah so i was backing different people in different cities so i had these relationships um and then when i guess when the whole market crashed in uh in like 2001 like yeah it, it was on the, it was on a downward turn. Like it, it was becoming, it had become too big. Yeah. Right. So it had become so big and it was basically, it was like the cool thing to do. And then once all these people started coming in, all the cool people left. Yeah. So then, you know, it kind of, so without like the, the, <sighs> you know, and again, this is free internet. Um, I mean, that's internet's the baby. Yeah. And so, you know, people just, there was no backbone to it. There was no, uh, people didn't, you know, people didn't really know the artist. People didn't, it just kind of, you know, it just imploded on itself Yeah. because it, you know, it wasn't based on, it was like a scene. Mm-hmm. It wasn't based on, um, it was just based on, like, oh, this is the cool thing to do. Uh, it wasn't based on like the music or anything like that. So, and then we had like, we had the, the, the you know, the, the legal problems, um, and, you know, getting venues and, and then nine 11 happened. Yeah. Um, and that's when, you know, and at the same time, like hip hop was exploding. Massive. Yeah. Right. So the, all these things came together. It was like a perfect storm. And, you know, when we came out of it, like, you know, the rave scene was like cut in half. Yeah. Like, it, you know, people, it was, a uh, it, it was like a totally different world. So, you know, that's when I started going around. So people stopped doing shows. I mean, they just couldn't, it w- didn't make any financial sense to do them. 
Um, so I started going around to all the old promoters in the different markets and we're like, Hey, you know, uh, let's, let's do shows. We'll do cheap tickets. Um, we'll, we'll gather the people's email addresses. And when this thing comes back, then, you know, we'll be in the perfect position. So I was able to kind of end up partnering up with a lot of people, um, that already had been doing shows in the past, but just weren't doing anything anymore. Mm. And that's kind of how I spread around at the, you know, the, the, there wasn't a lot going on. So the agents were looking for um, like connector dates. Right. So I would, I could do like Thursday in Austin, Friday in Houston, Saturday in Dallas, you know, so it was real easy for the agent just to contact me, send me a week. I've got Benny Benassi or whatever. I've got, you know, so, oh, we'll do a Midwest run. I'll do uh, Cleveland, Nashville, Columbus. Uh, and then we'll, the next weekend we'll do a Texas run. So yeah. it just, uh, that's kind of how I built out the company at the time. And, you know, I got everywhere from from New York to to Miami to, you know, Seattle to L.A., you know. So, I mean, it it was working. I'm just, I was just really bad at contracts. <laughs> what made you say that? <laughs> Cause I had a lot of partners. I've had a lot of partners and yeah. uh, they haven't all ended very well. So that's the joys of business though, right? When money, yeah, goes, you know, money I'm not going to change. So yeah. I'm not, I still don't, I'm still bad at contracts. So, <laughs> so that's when, on them. That's on them. That's not on me. So you kind of, uh, one of the reasons why electronic music grew back into the states after the crash right you kept the scene going um i mean look there was a lot of people i don't want to like i'm not taking credit for anything but i was there um and i wasn't stopping and it was rough um it was some very lean years uh my wife was doing a residency you know we were having our second kid yeah uh, you know, I can't, you know, there's, I have like very little money coming in. I'm still doing shows all over the place, but you know, it's not really, I wouldn't say it's financially successful. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't get any credit cards. I'm at the gas station trying to get, put gas in the car and, you know, I can't, not all of my masks out, <laughs> you know, you have to borrow your wife's credit card and, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not like a, it, it wasn't a good feeling. It was a lot, a lot of, uh, lean times and a lot of like, uh, times where I had to, you know, really think like, um, you know, can I, is this, can I do this? You yeah. know? So, and there was a lot of people that, there was a lot of people that I worked with that just tapped out and just said, I can't do this anymore. Um, you know, I'm going to go get a job. <laughs> I'm like, this is a job. We got jobs. <laughs> Nobody thinks it's a job, but we got jobs. But yeah. Well, I, um, I think the thing is, is when you, when you love doing something that you do, like you will literally just go until it ends to, right. to keep going. No, I mean, right. No, yeah. I mean, I loved it. Um, and uh, yeah, it definitely, it definitely kept it going through the, through the bad times. I mean, I knew it would come back. I didn't know it would, I never knew it would get as big as it did. Yeah. I mean, in an imaginary world, I guess we could say, Oh, I knew that, but I don't think anybody did. Um, so, you know, when it started, like started like bubbling up again, like, I mean, you know, I'm talking about from 2001 to 2007, eight. I mean, that's some like, that's a long time to be, (laughs) uh, paddling, do, doing a doggy paddle, you know, yeah, hoping that yeah. you can get to the end to the, find the island, right? Of, and then, yeah, when 2007, eight started hitting and people started using, you know, uh, uh, dance, you know, started using uh, electronic music and, and, and the hip hop songs and, um, and Lady Gaga and stuff like that. And there's now they're playing like dance music on the radio again. So it EDM. just really, yeah. The, so the EDM day saved saved American something dancing. like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. Now, da- Daft Punk playing at Coachella saved the 
save the world. Did that was that a, a huge thing for you guys? Because it's very it was it very was, different in the UK. Like when I I was or I'm obviously from the UK, but like growing up in the UK, electronic music scene has it's always been there ever since the nineties and never. Really yeah, gone I mean, away. look when you're like when you're in the UK, you know you you're born with that, right? Yeah. So when you walk into a McDonald's in the in Europe, they're playing they're playing um, house music. Yeah. So you know it's that. And the United, and so people are like grow up, and that's their life. That's their lifestyle. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. they never, they don't wander far from that. No. Nope. And so, but in the states, um, you know, we change our musical taste, like we change our underwear, right? So <laughs> everybody just, oh, every five years now, um, you know, now I'm line dancing. Oh, now I'm hip hop. You know, so, so like true. we don't have like a, we don't, we don't, we're not very good at commitment. Let's yeah. just put it that way. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so. It definitely, but it just, you also know that it's going to cycle back and yeah. cycle back and cycle back. So when you have downturns, um, you know, you go back to the bottom of the barrel and then eventually you'll come back up to the top. Mm. So that's kind of what we were waiting for. But yeah, that Daft Punk thing, I think it was like where I think that people could finally just putting the visualization with the music. Yeah. Um, and having all those tastemakers there and where they were like, oh, like now I can, I get it now. Right. So because before it was like, oh, it all sounds the same. It's just, you know, bleeps and blips and blah, blah, blah. But when you, when those people saw the show with the music, then they're like, oh, no, now th this makes sense. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's not just, it's not just the music. It's, it's, it's everything that goes with it. And, you know, that's when I think Kanye started, you know, sampled, uh, sampled them. And, you know, that's when people started like taking notice again. Mm, yeah, totally. Totally. That makes, that makes sense. Um, your first, what was your first ever festival of you actually running? My first ever festival. Wow. Um, I did, a outdoor festival well we you know we our big shows were like in a theater right so we would call them festivals per se they could yeah. be like five stages or okay. whatever but that's a festival. that's like a little yeah i mean now it is but i mean it was i mean that was a that was at a venue the first time i did something it was at a college it was like 98 um and yeah uh, i was working with uh the the my partner was the actually the owner of the venue uh, of the theater that I worked with. So he had, thank God he was there because, um, you know, I had no clue yeah. what, what I was doing. Um, and would have been, uh, it would have been an epic yeah, disaster. <laughs> like, I don't even think I ordered, uh, I think the sound guy got, we'll be doing load in the stage. And the guy's like, where's the fence? And I'm like, fence. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you need a fence. I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean that this is kind of um, you know, a, a little kid trying to do a big show. And we mm. had like 8,000 people. Wow. It was two yeah, it was two stages. It went till 7 a.m. <laughs> how do you even sell How do you even sell 8,000 tickets? <laughs> I don't time? know. It was at, <laughs> I mean, and that, at the time, I mean, 8,000 then was like it, it you know, it, it was like 20, 30,000. Yeah like two years later. So, and if we could have been able to, it was great. The show was great. There was no issues. Um, just the, you know, the, the, uh, with the college wouldn't let us do it again. Um, uh, I guess they had some issues, but, uh, if we would have been able to do it the next year, it would have been 20,000 people yeah. and it would have been better. Cause, uh, you know, I learned and then I'm trying my first LA, experience was the um i th think it was like uh a partner with pasquale and we did like uh nocturnal yeah in 99 and that was like my first like uh the, like basically we had sold like eight thousand pre-sales and literally like 20,000 people showed up. No way. Uh, yeah, trying to get in the gates. And, you know, we were just unprepared. 
So it was, you know, it was creating like a, uh, uh, the, the the venue had had a show the, the week before and I think they had like three or 4,000 people. So I think that's kind of what they were expecting. And yeah, we, we kind of blew that out of the water. Mm. And so the people were, you know, tearing down the gates. And I mean, I don't know if you ever, LA is like a whole different animal. Yeah. Like they, yeah, that, that energy there is crazy. Like, so um, people were like, you know, they, the, there was metal fences. It's at the, the uh, National Orange Show where they yeah. still do shows, and so they would go through fences and they break down a section, and everybody would just <laughs> run in, and then security would run over there and put the fence back up, and then they break down another section. So they, um, I think we ended up getting about eight thousand people in, but they when they then they had the hel- they had the hel- police helicopters and everything, and they, they ended up tear gassing. Um, <laughs> Like the 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 gate, it was crazy. That's wild. I, I, I mean, like Groove Rider. I remember all of these Groove Rider got tear gassed, and all these artists <laughs> coming in with like, I was like, oh, I was like, I don't want to do shows in LA. No. Uh, yeah. So I've had some, I've had some rough experiences, but you, you know, you learn from them, right? Yeah, it's the whole fun of it, and I think at the time, it's all super stressful when it happens, but then a few months later you can laugh about it and then a few years later it's, uh, this, it's the best story this one ever. Was it. i'm laughing about it now i guess yeah, so exactly. i had to stay in la i had to stay in la and um for like two or three weeks just to refund it, like the people that didn't get in so oh, it was crazy really? that's mad yeah do you still partner with pasquale at all no um i think that um our business relationship ended like in 2012 yeah so we still chat Still, still on good terms, though. Yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, to ask him. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. It must be. It must be interesting. With I want to kind of breach over that 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 relationship though, because both of you guys have done amazing things in the electronic scene, and it feels like from the outside, and obviously it might not be like this on the inside, but it feels like that there isn't. I know there's, of course, there's competition between every promoter in the world. There's competition between every artist in the world. However, I'm a firm believer that there's space for everybody at some point, somewhere. And it really feels like you have your space and Insomniac has their space. And together, you guys are creating something really interesting for American electronic music, which it, it it doesn't really happen elsewhere. Yeah, no, I mean, um, like I was a part of that uh, for whatever, 12, 13 years and brought, yeah. you know, EDC to Orlando and, yeah. um, and New York and, and, you know, the, the beyond Wonderland to Seattle and uh, EDC to Puerto Rico. And so, um, yeah, I was a part of that. Um, so, and, you know, now you know, they're, I mean, they're doing their thing. I mean, what they do is, you know, I, uh, you know, to be there from like the ground floor. I mean, we were doing, yeah, I mean, we were doing 10,000 people for EDC in LA. I mean, in, in San Bernardino, like in 2012, yeah. 2013 was like 10,000 people. 2014 was like 10. So, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't an overnight success. So to be there for that and see that uh, and what it's become like EDC Vegas is like crazy. Yeah. Like it's like, it's a real, um, it's like Disney world. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they do their own thing. I mean, uh, I, and I do mine, so, uh, we don't cross paths that often. I mean, sometimes we are button heads, little places in some markets, yeah. but, uh, you know, that's to be expected, yeah, yeah. but yeah, I mean, we've talked about it. Um, and you know, it's, uh, yeah, he's happy. He, Pasquale's happy, he's successful. I'm happy. I'm semi successful. <laughs> so <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, I mean it's it's not uh I mean maybe it's like a friendly competition or whatever. I mean course, not trying yeah. to kill each other or anything. So yeah, yeah. that's that's good. It's nice to hear though that as well, because I think there's so much there, there could be so much animo- animosity between Animosity, yeah. right. That's what my 
That was the word I couldn't say. Earlier, I can't right? I don't know. Say it, man. Okay. Um, when, um, with regards to the, your team, like obviously you have a big team around you, but how how have you kind of like situated your team around you? Because you can't do everything. You physically can't. I'm sure you have a lot of stays, but like yeah. How how is how has that built over the years and who are those people? Well, um true. Can't I can't do everything. I used to try to do everything yeah. and it took that was the hardest part was basically uh and this is probably the hardest part for anybody that has their own uh company yeah. is to be able to let go of yeah. something, right? So um I you know, I used to I I hung on to like doing the bookings for too long and and uh and the settlements and just everything that i was trying to do just because i didn't want to lose the like that i didn't want to lose the contact with the agents i didn't want to you know but you know in the end when i was able to finally start relinquishing why do we keep using these words we can't say (laughs) we Um, clearly didn't go to school probably (laughs) i really should have go back so um so basically, I'm trying to use big words, but I don't know how to even use, <laughs> use them, right? So I know what they mean. I just can't say them. Yeah. I guess it, I, it's like, I get half credit for that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, but been, when I started giving up stuff and I was like, oh, this is amazing. I, I started, uh, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I had more time for myself. I'm not talking. I mean, I literally had a cell phone, a house phone and an office phone. And I would have three calls coming at the same time yeah. from like the same agency. Like, the, the, you know, when I first started, there was like one agent and then there was like, oh, there was like three or four agents, but they only, they didn't have, they had like an assistant or maybe they didn't have anybody. Yeah. And there was one of me and one of them, the four agents, right? So that wasn't that bad. Now all of a sudden those agents have 20 agents under them yeah. <laughs> and they're, you know, so I have from the same company three different agents calling me at the same time because uh, they didn't have anybody else to call. Yeah. There was no other, there was no other, but there was nobody else doing shows. Mm. So, um, you know, they're, they're calling me. So I learned like once I, once I gave up the bookings, I was like, Oh, this feels good. This is how it should be. And so I, uh, yeah, I started, you know, so I've had my core team, uh, a lot of them have been with me for like over 10 years. Mm. Um, I mean, most, uh, we've been able to, we've been really good at retaining people. I mean, we've lost a few good ones and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's natural. I've I've never, I've never like tried to hold anybody back. Right. So if somebody wants to move on and they have a better opportunity, um, then, and that's what they want to do. You know, I'll write the, re- I'll write the recommendation for them. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I don't want them to come try to hurt me, Yeah. but, uh, but yeah, it happens. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, we have like, I mean, we're not a huge team. Maybe I have like 16, 17, like full part-time people. And I mean, mo- most of us full-time, maybe a couple of part-time people. And then, um, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously when we're doing a festival or something that we're bringing on another thousand people. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, we've been lucky to to keep the same core group together for a long time. Yeah. Everybody knows each other. Everybody knows like, oh, you know, he's just coming back from a festival. He's going to be grumpy today <laughs> or, you know, whatever. <laughs> it happens. Right. Yeah. So then I'm talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm still tired from I'm still tired from last week's trip. So. I can imagine. Do you go to every festival? Yeah, I mean, any all the big stuff. I, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm I'm at for sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't go to as many of the club events as I used to, yeah. um, just because it's just it's not worth it. I mean, it's you my recovery life. times a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. And then somebody might give me drugs or something like that. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I might get dosed. <laughs> so it's. So, makes so sense. Um, somebody dosed me with some cocaine, and, <laughs> and now I'm grumpy. <laughs> what a shame! What a shame! <laughs> yeah, now um, I want some. <laughs> I <laughs> I read online that you guys do over a thousand shows a year. Yeah, 
How? I think it was like, yeah, we were over a thousand, uh, probably going into COVID. I think we're like at 800 now. So we might need to like modify that one. It just sounds so, it sounds so much better than 800, but yeah. Yeah. But like uh, a, even 800, but like a, a thousand shows is like 2.5 shows a day. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's definitely some hundred show weekends, like, you know, Halloween weekend or something. Yeah. Or new, I mean, so it gets kind of crazy when there's like some, some weekends where there's like 10 shows or something. So, um, you know, we, it's, it's, it's difficult because the, you know, the, a lot of these venues are, they only have 52 Fridays and 52 Saturdays. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, they, they pretty, they want content all the time. And we are like, Oh, you know, we, uh, you know, we're tr- we, our job is like to try to keep them in business. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and not all of them are going to be winners. Um, so we have different deal structures set up yeah. where, you know, we're protected on some of these because, uh, so, you know, I don't want to just do shows just to do shows. Not worth it. Um, but, you know, th- it's a good way to be able to uh, develop talent, bring in new people and stuff and, and, and see how it goes. Well, it's really, it's also really interesting. You're developing cities as well, which th- that are cities that you wouldn't think sh- have electronic music in. Yeah, that's been all my, I mean, when, um, you know, that was when, when I first started going around the country, I was kind of, I basically based it on where people, I wasn't going in where people were, right? Yeah. So, I wasn't going in uninvited. Um, so, you know, I was going where, you know, that stuff wasn't happening. So, you know, if you go into a New York or an LA or, something like that, you know, you better bring the big guns because, um, you know, you're going to be fighting against 10, 15, 20 promoters and they're not going to be, they're not going to be happy and they're not going to play fair. Uh, they're not going to play nice. Yeah. Uh, so, and you're going to work, you know, I've had many opportunities to, I've had many offers to go into LA, um, since I, you know, since I stopped working with Insomniac and I'm just like, I mean, what do you, it's just, I would have to work 20 times as hard, yeah. uh, you know, t- to produce, um, you know, the same effort as if I could just go do a show in like Nashville, Tennessee. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, why am I going to, why am I going to beat my head against the wall, yeah. um, for, for, and, you know, upset the apple cart, turn over the apple cart just yeah. to, to prove a point. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've managed to just try to stay away from all those, those bigger markets. No, I, I think it's really interesting what you've done and it makes complete sense as well. There's a lot of space in America, a lot of places, yeah. a lot of cities. It's, uh, it's a big old there country. You go. It's a big old country. The, the um, only smart thing I've ever done <laughs> or said so, as well. So talking about things you said. Um, oh God. Here we go. What I say? Here we go. I, we, I saw a tweet I, and, I saw that wasn't me. <laughs> I saw a tweet and it said, I forgive you. My, I got hacked. I got hacked. <laughs> it said, I forgive you, Joe Biden. Oh, did I say that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. I want to, well, I want to, I've, I've been told a brief story about your relationship between you and Joe Biden over the years. Um, and I kind of want, I don't know the full story. So I want to, I want to get to know what, what is this? Well, um, yeah. So I guess in the, in, in or around like 99, uh, 2000, um, the, uh, the, the DEA, um, uh, opened up, a, I guess, a, uh, a case on me and the theater I was working at. And so they followed me. I mean, like sur- under, I was under surveillance for like eight months. That's crazy. Uh, so they went to a bunch of my shows. Well, I always thought they were, but I was like super paranoid <laughs> at the time, right? Who knows what drugs I was on? So, um, so, but yeah, it's like, oh, I, I was like the guy in uh, Goodfellas, right? The helicopters yeah. follow me and shit. I mean, yeah. that's a, the, I was like the Henry Hill character. So I was like, but my phone was tapped. I mean, so. Was it really? Anyway. No, I mean, it was. I mean, I don't think they, I, um, 
I don't think it was legally tapped. Yeah. I don't know if they got the court order for that. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, definitely sounded like it was tapped. <laughs> or I always thought it was, right? So we were joking around, like, hey, come, you know, pick up the stash or whatever. It's like, because you could hear the people, it was like clicking the whole time. Yeah. Like somebody was on the line, like, yeah. like, hey, we can hear you. Um, so, uh, but you know, I didn't know, no. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, they had like, you know, when I went, when they finally arrested me or whatever, they, uh, so what happened? <laughs> Jump <my head. laughs> I'm jumping right to the end. Yeah. Uh, that's how I do. That's how I tell stories. I'm amazing. I'm just the clip notes. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, they, they were attending, uh, our shows and they were purchasing, they were making drug purchases. Yeah. And then they, instead of like, uh, and we, we knew they were in there, right? Because we let them in. Yeah. Like they showed their, they showed, so we knew they were there. Um, so we thought we were like, we thought we were cooperating. And, uh, <laughs> but they weren't, they weren't going after the drug dealers. They were going after us. So that like, instead of arresting the person they bought the drugs from and trying to find out where that guy got the drugs from, they were like just putting it in my, putting like it in um, in my bag, right? Like, oh, this is on, this is another, you know, here's another 10 pills for Donnie, you know? Yeah. So they were just like, <laughs> like adding it up. And I'm like, oh shit, you know, like, like, um, like, so I don't know this is going on. And so, uh, yeah, they, so they raid, it was like August of 2000. And like the scene is like, this is like, it's blowing up. Yeah. This is like the, this is the, this is the, this is like the best time. This is way beyond our, we're just like five, 6,000 people every month. Yeah. Right. And I got now, I have another, I've got a venue inside the theater that we're doing drum. We're doing weeklies, drum and bass weeklies, thousand people every week, just like everything's off the chains. And, uh, we have a show, it's like 4,000 sold in advance. So we're probably going to do five or 6,000 people. And, uh, the DEA raids the place. Um, but not during the show, they raided, um, like two or three hours before doors. Mm. So, you know, I wasn't even, I wasn't even there yet. Uh, cause now by this time I'm like, I'm the high falutin promoter and I just show up at the end, you know, and just take all the credit. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> that hasn't changed. So, yeah. um, so basically, yeah, it, the, the, the venue owner called me. He's like, Donnie, don't come down here. Um, you know, I'm, uh, the we've been raided, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, for what? And he's like, I don't know. They're like, basically, you know, they were searching through all the uh, sound equipment, all the turntape. They were opening everything up. You know, they had this theory that we were, um, like, we were taking, we were bringing the drugs in before the show. And then we were selling them from backstage to the people, right? So they, those, in their mind, th that, um, in their minds, the the drug dealers were working for us, yeah. right? So when they were buying those drugs, they thought that, and that's kind of how they sold it to to uh, come to find out they had gone in front of Congress and got funds to run this whole operation, and you know. And this is how they got the search warrants and, and all that stuff, right? That they had this theory. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, we, like I had the the drug, I would run the drug dealers and they had VIP passes and they would go back and forth. And and there probably was drug dealers going back and forth <laughs> backstage, but they weren't working for me. Yeah. So, you know, they had like, they had parts of the story and then they made up into this whole like fantasy world that I was selling the drugs. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, they ended up tearing, searching everybody and, you know, t tearing everything up. And basically, they found, like, one joint on a bartender. <laughs> They're like, oh, <laughs> shit. So, um, at the same time, I was, uh, I was, and now I've, I've arrived. I've flushed all the drugs at my house down the toilet. Um, so, in case they were going there. And then I, um, I'm basically... Uh, at, you know, I'm, I'm underneath the venue and I have, I'm at a restaurant that's connected to the theater, um, but on the side of it. And I'm directing all my team to basically uh, tell people in line that we're going to open tonight. And so like, 
you know, some people left or whatever, but there's still like a huge crowd. And eventually the, the DA gets worn down. They're like, Oh, it's nap time. Right. It's like 11 or 1130. So then, so they, they leave, they actually walk in into the restaurant I'm at. And then I like as they're ordering, I like sneak out, the, <laughs> sneak out through the door. So I was like, I, um, I wish we had a photo of that one. I mean, mm. I could draw you one. But anyway, so it was pretty it was pretty amazing. And we opened the fucking doors and we had the party and they were pissed that we did the show. Um, and they said, you know, basically come get your, get a lawyer and, you know, we'll talk to you on Monday. Yeah. So, yeah, on Monday. We went in and they, you know, we went and met with the lawyer and we're like, what is, you know, cause I mean, everybody thought it was taxes or something because we, we, we definitely had tax issues. So, <laughs> um, I've cleared those up. I've cleared it up <laughs> right away. But at the time I did, I'd had tax issues. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, every that's what I thought. And then we, the guys like, I remember the venue owner had his wife and, um, in there and we're just like what is it you know what it, what, what could it be and they're like well you're getting charged with the crack house law and we're like what, what? <laughs> yeah the crack house like what's that oh well what's the what's the uh what's the time on that well it's zero to 20 whoa oh, <laughs> okay yeah how well how many drugs like how do you get the years oh well they it depends on how many drugs they bought I'm like well how much did they buy 18 years worth i'm like oh shit so like the, the guy's wife's crying, people are like falling on the floor. It's like a, a you know a Baptist church revival. People yeah. are like you know convulsing everywhere and stuff. And um, you know basically, uh, you know, and then he's like, "Well, that's not the bad one. That's the good one." I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he's like, "And you're getting charged with a, a continuing criminal enterprise, a CCE, which is what they use to." Um, to break up the mob, right? Mm-hmm. So basically, you're you're doing a you're doing something illegal multiple times, and they're like, "Well, what's that?" They're like, "Twenty to life." <laughs> it's like life, yeah. So you know, and here's like twenty something year old me, right? And I, I'm like, "Huh," you know. It's like it was just it was crazy, like to have that be dropped on our my yeah. my head, and I still never knew the the gravity of it all. Um, because I still kept on, uh, I still try to do, I had shows scheduled that was supposed to be at the theater and I thought they were like chasing that venue, but they were actually chasing me. So I moved, like I moved the show, uh, um, I moved a couple of shows and they, you know, they harassed everybody there and I moved another one and they shut it down. So, uh, I just started doing, uh, shows like at house of blues, which yeah. is like a live nation venue. Yeah. Um, I started doing a weekly there. So. I never stopped doing shows, but I just didn't really understand. I don't think like really what I was like getting myself into. How did it stop? Well, um, yeah, I had to turn myself in and, you know, I had a bunch of meetings with them and they were, uh, you know, basically telling me how, you know, bad of a person I was and all this other stuff. And I could tell that like they didn't really, they didn't really get it. Um, and, uh, but you know, what am I, what am I supposed to do? My lawyer at the time didn't really, he doesn't, nobody you understands this is 2000, right? Yeah. This is like, this is think of how, how much the world has changed the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, you know, people, I don't know what people are going to think about this. I know people are like when the government's saying that, um, ruining people's kids lives and, um, uh, you know, I mean, people are going to listen, right? They're like, yeah. we win. I don't know if you know how the, the justice system works, but they're like, it was a federal case. And they're like, oh, we're going to wow. bring in a hundred agents from DC. This is a, uh, you know, this is a priority for us. This is a test case for them. Right. Cause they wanted to stop. They wanted to stamp out raves everywhere. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're going to bring in, uh, you know, all these agents. We're going to arrest you on TV at 6 a.m. at your mom's house, we're going to, uh, um, you know, we're going to, this is going to be all over the news. You know, this is going to be, this is going to be bad. We win. 
99.999% of our federal cases, which is, that's like a true number. Yeah, yeah. Like they, yeah, they win these cases. So it's like, wow, that's a pretty good, it's a pretty, <laughs> so what's my chance? Uh, so you're saying there's a chance for me. I get like 0.001% chance I could, I could possibly get out of this. So uh, yeah, they were all, you know, so my lawyers like, yeah, you got to talk to them, see what they offer you. Right. And so uh, they were offering me like a year like they just wanted this case, they just wanted this, like this precedent set, right? Mm. So then they could just go around and hit everybody over else over the head with it. And so I don't. That's how like law in the United States works, right? Yeah. If somebody sets this up once, then basically like, oh, look, it worked here, and the yeah. other judge is like, well, yeah, that's fine. I mean, we got to go with that. Whatever that guy made the decision. So um, they were off me a year. Like, and they're like, oh, you know, you can get out in six months and then go to the halfway house for six months. And I'm like, you know, you have to think about it when you have a year versus like life. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, oh, you know, what's the possible chance? What if I get a bunch of like na- grannies in there in the courtroom <laughs> on the jury and, you know, you don't know what judge you're going to get. You don't know where, like, the district you're going to have, the, where, you know, what's the, uh, where what's the jury pool going to look like? Um, and, you know, so that's why they win a lot of these cases because, you know, they, people, a lot of times people plead guilty. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So just went through the whole motion of it all. I got a new lawyer and he was like, yeah, just, just keep telling them, keep talking to them and keep saying, you're going to like, you're going to, you're thinking about it. You're going to work with them until you go in front of that judge and say you're guilty. Then, um, uh, uh, you know, then, you know, it, it's nothing. You can say anything you want to them. Just don't. So they were pretty confident that we were going to plead guilty. So they went on to like, they went on TV and did their big press conference about like what, and that's when everything changed Yeah, because um, you can't, I don't know if you know about all some criminal cases, you can't really talk about it with anybody. So nobody really knew what was going on. Mm. And I couldn't really, if you tell somebody you involve, you engage them in the case, right? Totally. So now they're, um, you know, so now they've become a witness and they're now they're, they're involved, right? Who, so who wants to bring this mess on to other people? Um, so, you know, and they gave, they had given immunity to everyone that worked at the, worked at the venue. And so, and they were, you know, they were really coming after us. The, th- the thing is I never sold any drugs, you know, I wasn't like, um, uh, I wasn't that smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I wasn't that stupid. Um, I could have, I just did. No, I just, that wasn't who, what I was, you know, yeah. I was, I was the promoter. I wasn't the drug dealer Yeah. and you know, everybody has their role. Yeah. And so in my, I, I was doing mine and to, I guess I was doing it too well, but, uh, and maybe they were doing theirs. They were doing their poor job of theirs, but, um, so yeah, I, you know, I basically, uh, they went on TV and they said, sorry, I'd have these long run on. No, it's fine. It's fine. So uh, yeah, sorry people. <laughs> um, so they basically went on TV and said, Hey, we got this case. This is the worst case ever. And like the, the U S attorney said it was the most unconscionable, unconscionable drug offense he's ever seen in his whole 30 years career. Wow. He, meanwhile, he had like police selling cocaine and killing people and stuff. And this was worse than that. This was worse than that. This was the worst one. Um, so, uh, you know, basically it was a big to do. They had all the photos, of the ravers with the, with the glow sticks mm. and all, you know, Oh my God. So, and then it went like this, like right now it's like in a newspaper, people are writing letters in so that, you know, this is like, a uh, a reach it's on the talk radio like people are like this is bullshit yeah. you're gonna arrest all the promoters you know for somebody smoking a joint at at a at jazz fest and so i was like oh wait i'm not crazy yeah like people people do get this that you know i i never thought i was guilty of anything and i never thought i should plead guilty um but i just didn't know what i, I don't know what other people thought of right course. and i and so when I got that and then the ACLU got involved because now, now it's like people know people thought I was doing something wrong. Yeah. And now they realize like, Oh, this is bullshit. And that's kind of when 
I had this wave of support, you know, come come up, and then I was able to be like, okay, now I can talk about this in general terms with people, right? And say, because this is all public knowledge. And then they're like, yeah, this is bullshit. And I'm like, yeah, it's bullshit. They're like, no, this is bullshit. I'm like, yeah, it's bullshit. I know. <laughs> and so, but, you know, when you be able to bounce that off of people, um, it definitely, it changed the the narrative and how, and what I was going to do. And, um, you know, I, I remember, like, I was still doing shows the whole time. <laughs> I was like, ah, you know, dumbass, like yeah. little kid, like, uh, but it, it by me doing these shows every weekend, like it just like it showed to them that like if they were going to put me in jail for doing shows and then I came right back out of I went to, you know, I had to go turn myself in for one day and I kept doing shows, but then they couldn't put me in jail for these other shows. Yeah. It was just like, you know, it just it didn't make any sense. So, um, yeah, I just remember I was like, no. Nope. You know, I'm not taking the plea deal. You know, I'm sorry. You know, sorry. You know, like you guys, I understand. You know, you're trying to do your job, but I'm just doing mine. Yeah. And you know, you're after you got the wrong guy. And so, yeah, they were like threatening me, and they were like, "We're gonna get you one day, and we'll see see you soon." You know, they were like, "We see that file cabinet over there? That's all you." And I was like, oh, uh, uh. <laughs> "I'm like, I was like, oh, geez, you know, so." <laughs> There's a lar- very large file cabinet somewhere with a uh, with a lot about me. <laughs> so hopefully they'll release it uh, 50 years after my death. <laughs> Damn, that's a wild story. Anything to stop and the so, raves. And Joe Biden was all behind that, I take it. Well, no. So I think the main thing was, um, his main thing was, uh, um, after this, I'm not really sure what, who was like, you know, that was when Clinton was in office and stuff. So, um, but basically, you know, the main thing that the, on the Biden connection is, you know, a couple, like a year or two later, they tried to, they, you know, when, when they realized they, they ran this crack house um, case on a club in, in Panama city that was like famous for, they would do MTV event, uh, spring break yeah. club La Vila. And they actually went to trial with that one. And the jury came back in five minutes and said that they said, this is bullshit. (laughs) So I was like, I told you, I told you. (laughs) So, uh, so basically they, that was the end of their, their kind of crack house, like dalliance where they, they were like, okay, this isn't going to work. Um, so basically they, uh, the next round of this was they tried to do the, the rave act. Yeah. And so, um, and that was the one where, you know, there's the videos of Joe Biden online and, you know, he's basically, you know, railing against rave promoters and saying, you have to arrest the promoter. And, you know, this is where the, the rave acts came through. Um, and it was basically, it was a, it was attached to like an Amber alert bill, um, which is like when uh, Amber alert is when, um, a, a child gets kidnapped. Yeah. In, in the United States. Um, and then, you know, they, they sent out this alert to everyone. Right. So the, so who's going to vote against that? <laughs> right. So this, they, Oh, Amber alert and rave act together. Sounds like a fucking match made in heaven. And so it passed and, but Biden was like the, like one of the strongest, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess supporters of that. And his video is like pretty, um, it's pretty silly. Mm. Um, and but it, it's just interesting that he's the president now. So I think when, uh, you know, when uh, on the last, so just to wrap this one up. So th- the reason I was having, um, when when after before the last election, you know, I was having people from both sides like uh, asking me to come out and like su- like support one of the presidential of course, candidates of course. and uh, I, I live in Puerto Rico, so I can't even vote. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and who wants to listen to who I, you know, who wants to listen to me? Like I'm who a fucking cares? rave promoter, yeah, right? Yeah, Nobody cares? like, I don't want to influence anybody. I just want people to register. I just want people to vote. Yeah. So that was what I was concentrating on. Um, but, uh, 
the the I guess the I forgive you Joe Biden just to put a Wrap bow on this yeah. giant long thirty minute story um, was basically uh, his daughter um, used to go to my events. Oh no right? way! So and I know she had issues with you know whatever things like a lot of kids do go through things right experiment with things um so i always looked at it i have kids right so i just looked at it as like basically he was projecting like trying to protect his daughter that's just how i rationalized yeah, it yeah. in my head yeah, yeah. He, even though he was wrong but i'm trying to like i'm just trying to imagine where that came from and where that vitriol came from and i'm assuming that it's possibly came from that place. And I, as a father, know that when my kid fucks up, I got to blame somebody. Else. Of course. Because <laughs> <laughs> I did a perfect job. <laughs> it's not his fault and it's not my fault. It's so whose yours. fault is it? It's the Ray from Rose's <laughs> fault. So I think that's where that came from. Yeah. And end scene. <laughs> and the rave promoter is always easy. <laughs> it is so easy to blame. Like it's countless countless times. Uh, like fabric in London got closed down for God knows how long because somebody died outside. And right. it, and it's like I get it. It's it, it's very easy. it's an easy thing for the law system to blame somebody and we're the people that they're gonna blame. Simple. Right. So well, I'm used to it. So yeah, of course. Uh, of course. I'm here. For, I'm here for it, <laughs> dude. We've just, I can take it. We've just done an hour and a half. And oh I'm, shit! And I'm sure we could keep I'm, talking. I, but I'm sure people are gonna be like, "Fuck this! <laughs> I'm not watching this shit." Uh, yeah, but, but I dude, think I blew through some calls already. So, sorry, okay. man. Sorry, yeah. man. Um, no, that's all right. But it, thank, was, it was fun. Thank I you. didn't know it was that long. So no, it was great. It was amazing. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate. It. And thanks, awesome. man. Thanks for having me at, at your shows over the years. Thank you for all the support and um, thank you for creating an amazing scene in, in America now. It's, it's, it's beautiful. How, how long are we going to do the beard here? Because I've seen, I've seen the photos of you pre-beard. I mean, you were like a like supermodel. Really? I've yeah. got, the thing is, I've got no hair now. On oh top. yeah, I see, so I see that. so okay. I'm. That's good. That's a good. That's a look, though. Yeah, I, I've got to kind of keep the. If I take this beard off, I still look like a yeah. fifteen-year-old. I it looks. I look yeah. so young. Um, but I tried. I've tried, but I once it gets like a little long, I just like it it's too. It's hot in Puerto Rico too, so maybe I have a, have multiple excuses here. There's stages. All right. Well, I'll, there's stages. I'll of see the beard. you soon. <laughs> yes, mate. Yes, I yes. Will, I'm sure I'll see you at a festival soon. Um, keep safe keep doing what you're doing and oh. really appreciate it man. all right thanks all right bye-bye thank you man and that's a wrap hope you enjoyed it hope everybody liked the conversation big love to donnie for coming on um thank you to all that's listened please share it keep safe see you next time